Thank you for listening to CLE Rocks, the music podcast from the birthplace of rock and roll. If you like what you hear, please leave a review on your podcast platform, and more importantly, click five stars to help us spread the word. I'm Troy L. Smith with Cleveland.com. Now, on with the show. So Steve and I, we wanted to kick things off, you know, um, before we get to the panel. And, and I want to let everybody know, Steve worked super hard on this event. I mean, he put this whole thing together, got the panel together, pushed and pushed to make sure we had a good night tonight, which we will. But I wanted to, you, in your words, tell everyone why this, this meant so much to you. You pushed really hard for this. Well, you know, music, as they say, is the soundtrack to people's lives. And uh, this particular album, Bad Out of Hell, you know, tonight, uh, today, you know, is the original release date of the 45th anniversary. Um, so, yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, the passing of, 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 of Senior back in 2011, and, and we lost Steinman a couple years ago. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we lost Meat. Um, earlier um, this year, and I, you know, I just thought that it was appropriate that a tribute be done to these three individuals, you know, um, and I don't know if I called S Joe Stefko first or Carla, but, you know, when I had the idea, I don't know, three, four months ago, I, I reached out to them, and, you know, they're like, you know, I asked if they would want to come in and be a part of it, you know, and, and, they said, absolutely, we'd love to. Whatever you want to do, we want to be there for your father, obviously me, and Steinman. And what better place than to do it than Cleveland, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, and, uh, you know, of course, reached out to Ellen, and, and she was totally in for it, and um, obviously reaching out to, to Pearl, Meet's daughter, um, was, was really, uh, I think, the final component to making this an incredible tribute to three of, you know, some of the most important people in my life, you know, um, me growing up. I mean, this is, is just part of all of our lives, you know. Um, obviously, I, I wasn't around during the era of bad and when everything went on, but, you know, I certainly, you know... Um, learned and heard firsthand stories from, from my father over the years. And it was after he had passed away that, um, you know, really connected with, with Carla and Ellen. We did a tribute in New York, and they were there, um, and, and Joe. Um, but, you know, we were over the Hall of Fame earlier today, and, and we were, in, you know, having a conversation with, with Greg Harris and some of the people there. But, you know, it's kind of like a, um, a family in some way. I mean, we're not, but we we're all tethered together around this incredible project that has meant so much to so many people all over the world, you know? And I don't know if anybody, last week it was announced uh, in the UK that Bad Out of Hell is the top selling album in the UK, you know? And, you know, top five selling album here in the, in the US. So to shut up and kind of get, to the point, it, 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 you know, it, it was something that I felt needed to be done, and I know these people knew that it needed to be done uh, out of love and respect and admiration for what they've done, not only to, obviously, the city of Cleveland, but to the entire world. And you I know? think, you know, we're going to celebrate these guys, you know, on the panel and throughout the night. I wanted to ask you, you know, your dad saw something in Meatloaf, Jim, Bad Out of Hell that nobody else saw, even the record label. <laughs> um, he accomplished a lot in his career. He worked with a lot of artists, promoted us a lot of artists, got their careers, you know, taken off. What did this album mean to him, you know, in terms of his career, his legacy? Sorry, let me turn this phone off here. Orlando, Florida. I don't, I don't know who that is. Spam, um, he spam calls. Probably. Yeah, uh, well, it became his calling card in life. I mean, he had an incredible career, all in thanks, by the way, to Frank Yankovic, America's Polka King, who gave him his first job in the record business, Columbia Records Warehouse here in Cleveland in 1962. Um, and from there, you know, in 1968, he became, you know, uh, an assistant to the vice president and worked his way up to being the first ever 
vice president of promotion at CBS Columbia Records, you know, at the age of 26, you know, and, and working with, you know, some of the most incredible talent um, in the world, you know. Um, but he was always somebody, I think, that wanted... He loved challenge. He loved proving people wrong. You know, he, he would always, you know, be stubbornly passionate about your beliefs. And, and that was his motto that he lived through up until he passed away, you know. Um, but he heard, you know, that something, you know. And knowing that, you know, he was coming off an incredible career at the peak of his career at CBS Records, wanting to move back to Cleveland because he wanted something, you know, that was his and something that his legacy would continue on, you know. Um, and, of course, the first thing was Ronnie Spector, East Street Band and all that. Um, but, y you know, you, you, you had Stymie and you had Meat. I mean, incredible dynamic. Uh, they were a great team. Um, and, and, you know, them getting turned down by everybody in the industry, from Mo Austin to Clive Davis, you know, you name it. And just how it all came together and how they met him when he had launched Cleveland International, he was looking for something, I believe, you know, to, to put everything into to prove people wrong, that he could go out and do this on his own. I mean, he did, you know, have the support of, you know, Epic and, and, and CBS, you know, uh, eventually. But, you know... He, they threw the kitchen sink at it, and for two years, I mean, they worked. My mother will tell you. She's in the house somewhere. <coughs> um, I mean, you know, they worked out of our house at Willoughby Hills, you know, for the first year, year and a half. Um, but uh, it, it, it was just one of those things when, you know, just magic happened, you know. Right place, right time. Timing is everything, right? Yeah. And it was just the right time. And I want to say, too, I know a lot of people here are aware of it, but what you've done to honor your father's legacy has been tremendous. Um, and if you don't know currently, you know, what you're doing with Cleveland International Records, you have the Southside Johnny albums, part of a series of live albums, you know, commemorating amazing shows. I just want to commend you because, you know, you've kept that legacy alive, you've kept that name alive, and this event is a great homage to your father, Meatloaf, Jim, so congrats to you and thanks for doing this. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to get out of your way, everybody's way for now. Yeah, for, yeah. yeah we're yeah. going to, we have a special treat before we bring the panel up. We have a sizzle reel. You want to introduce this for everybody, what they're going to see? So in, in uh, 2018, 2019, you know, I, I started working on my father's documentary and, um, you know, just getting various interviews done, you know, knowing that it, 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 to you know, again, legacy piece. Um, Barry Gordy had a saying, uh, if the lion don't take credit for the hunt, the hunter will. You know, in our business, that runs rampant. So I knew that it was something that I needed to do, wanted to do. Um, obviously, you know, uh, just, you know, as a father, but he was just a tremendous person, you know. And it, uh, anyway, I started working on that, and then COVID hit, and then we kind of paused, but we put together a scissor reel, so I thought it'd be appropriate, you know, playing the scissor reel to the documentary um, prior to the panel getting up here. Um, and then I'm going to sit and enjoy the show as well because I, uh, I have nothing but love and respect for these individuals. And you're going to hear something tonight and be a part of something tonight that I, I, I don't think that they've done collectively before. Um, and it's going to be an incredible evening, and you guys are in for a real treat. But to kick it off, we'll play the scissor reel, and then we'll introduce the panelists. All right. So enjoy, guys, and Sound we'll be good? back up here in a few minutes. Hello, Cleveland! Um, you know... This group, you know, in this audience doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce it, uh, everyone <laughs> anyway. Uh, we're here to celebrate the work of Me Love, Jim Steinman, and Steve Popovich, of course. Um, I want to start with a singer, actress, Broadway, powerhouse voice, 
uh, the voice behind Paradise by the Dashboard Light. <laughs> Uh, Ellen Foley, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Ellen, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. good. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Very happy to be here. Uh, next up, another singer, actress, and the only woman to perform with Meatloaf and Jim Steinman on stage and screen around the world in support of Bat Out of Hell, Carla DeVito, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Carla, how many autographs you sign already? Oh, no. I just went to the ladies' room. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it just happened. Uh, next up, a man who played with uh, John Cale, the Turtles, of course, Meatloaf, among others, uh, and then turned, which was really interesting, so I have to mention this, rare book collector and then book publisher, designer. Uh, I don't know what else he did. He's kind of sounded like Superman, the way I describe him. Uh, uh, Joe Stefko, everybody. Yeah. Um, a regular for our, our CLE Rock series uh, on the end here, uh, radio executive, uh, Cleveland radio legend, the man who ran WMMS during its glory days, and got WMMS to put Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell in heavy rotation, John Gorman. Uh, and last but certainly not least, sitting next to me, uh, <laughs> Uh, she worked and toured with her father, Meatloaf, for years and has put together her own distinguished music career, uh, working with the likes of Motley Crue, Filter, nice Cleveland connection there, uh, and has her own projects uh, with her band Pearl and Motor Sister, Pearl A Day, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so... Uh, Pearl, I wanted to start with you, actually. Um, I asked Steve this question, and, and I wanted to ask you, when, you know, in Meatloaf's whole career and all the time you spent with him, how did he talk about Bad Out of Hell? What did that album mean to him you know, through all the years and all, even all the other projects that he worked on? Bad Out of Hell is, um, is a, our lives. It's woven into my life. It's the fabric. It's the fabric of my life, <laughs> like cotton. Um, <laughs> um, he could. He, he was m extremely. I don't think he could even vocalize how proud he was of Bad Out of Hell. You know, um, it it was it was something that. <laughs> I I really want to hear you talk about it because you were there. But the way that Dad felt about it, he, I, he could barely even express it in words. It just was more about his energy and his action and um, his passion. He was pure, Dad was pure passion. It, um, you know, it was just for me being around it, it was incredible to see. It's incredible to hear. Um, I had the privilege of performing with him for nine years on stage with Bad Out of Hell 2. And every single night that I was on stage with him, I was blown away because he, that was his thing. He would say, when you go on stage, it's a privilege, it's not a right. It's not your right to be on stage, it's a privilege. And when you go out on stage, it doesn't matter if it's two people or two million or 50 million, or one. You give a thousand billion percent every single night. Um, and that's what he did every, every day of his life. <laughs> but he, um, he, Bad Out of Hell was, was really his life, I think, you know. It was something that he was unbelievably proud of. And, uh, yeah. I wanted, you know, in, in the same question um, for Carla, Ellen, uh, Joe, when you guys would reconnect with Milo and Jim as well over the years, you know, when you talked about that album, you talked about its legacy and what it meant to you guys, you know, what, what did Jim, you know, what, what did he say about it? <laughs> because he worked on a lot of, you know, obviously these guys have, they did more than, than this album, of course, but obviously this is a major accomplishment for them. So, how, you know, how did Jim talk about this? I 
it, I think Jim just, this was second nature to him. This is, you know, it came from his essence, his being. Had he never met Meatloaf, there might have been some kind of bad out of hell, but it certainly wouldn't have been the one that we all know and love. I mean, those songs are spectacular, but it was that perfect melding of uh, spirits. And they became really good friends again after, you know, after a, a long kind of separation for all kinds of reasons, which the business is so creepy in many <laughs> ways. So, uh, and should they have ever been separated? I didn't think so, but I think they should have called the album Meatloaf and Steinman. <laughs> and that, that, that might have solved a whole lot of problems at the beginning. But, you know, they're just... Both of them were just such huge, iconic figures. They, they became larger than life. And Jim kept going and writing for other people, but I really love everything he did on Bad Out of Hell. And, and you can probably, both of you, you've, uh, Joey was in touch with Jim um, towards the end. And, you know, so you know a little bit more about, about Jim in the present time, you know, uh, before he passed away. We never spoke about it. We never talked about Bat Out of Hell. I mean, it, 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 was our, it was our life, and we lived it. But Jim didn't, didn't talk about that stuff. We talked about other things, which I won't mention here. <laughs> Dogs. <But we> yeah, <laughs> but we didn't talk about the music. What I can say is when we started, when we were putting the band together to try to recreate this record, which it's monumental. The only thing he ever said to me was, you got to look at every song like you're on a motorcycle. <laughs> and and <coughs> you've got to go from gear to gear, and you never finish where you started in tempo which screwed me up for everybody else <laughs> I ever played with. <laughs> because everybody, but he, that's the way he saw these things. He said, you're on a motorcycle ride and you're driving. And, and we never spoke about it again after that. We, we, we just did it. So I can't really answer that question. <laughs> I mean, when you think about Bad Out of Hell for Jim, Unlike other albums that came after it, it was his culmination of his whole life. Yeah. I would say Jim came out of the out of the womb as whole cloth. I can't imagine Steinman as a little kid being innocent or not smart or not a, a genius. You know, I think he came out who he was. So I think all of this was was just there, and I w I was lucky to be in rooms and all around the country and in high schools and auditoriums when we were doing the tour of the, um, the National Lampoon Show. That's why I met Meatloaf and Jim. And to see, you know, to see it happening, the gestation of it and, and being, being around it um, was, was pretty amazing. But some of it, so much of it was there. A lot of these songs he had just had in his head and he was just, he, he found Meatloaf, Meatloaf, was his great instrument. Meatloaf was, uh, it started as Meatloaf, as, as Jim's instrument, and then it turned around, and, and you know, Meatloaf, of course, um, somebody else who was born as, as, as the, a whole cloth. Meatloaf was always Meatloaf, you know? These people who have incredible persona, characters, personalities, um, so I was, I was fortunate to be there and sort of watch, watch this dance happen. It, it wasn't always a, a smooth dance. There was a lot, of, a, lo a lot of emotion. There's always a lot of emotion with, with these guys. You know, I mean, Meat was emotional, okay? Meat was emotional, and Steinman would be, um, what do they say? Uh, you know, he would, he would just be, What's that word? What, um, what is it? When you don't, when you're, when you're like putting it out the vibe, but, but you're not yelling, you're just, yeah. Yeah, no, but yeah, nonchalant. Steinman and cool. Steinman, I'm sorry. 
I'm old, cool. and I, I've been up too long. <laughs> what the hell word am I thinking about? Is is it st- people alo- have said stoic. They said no. stoic. No. Is it aloof? No, no. <laughs> Out the way. And when I somebody, I'm when like somebody aloof. else is anyway. <laughs> no, it's yeah. just an amazing. Um, it, it was, was cool. It, it was, was just ju- cool. no. It, it, I'm saying it was an amazing dynamic because. Steinman knew how to press the buttons, you know? And the buttons created the drama, and the drama made the music, and the drama made the relationship, and the relationship brought us all here today. Oh, listen, hey, passive aggressive. That's what I was. That's, uh, that's, that's two words, that's two words. two words, we might have gotten that. I was gonna offer a free drink oh to anybody to guess, but anyway. Thank you for your patience. I really appreciate. I, John, I wanted I wanted to bring you in on the uh, <laughs> Steve Popovich connection because you knew Steve very well, and and obviously uh, me and Jim had this connection where they created this album. When when Steve came into the picture, what was it about these three guys um, that combined that? Because Steve was the last piece of the puzzle to get this album out. Um, that made this so big because it's up. To, I mean, it's it's. Yeah, well, I, I knew Steve before Cleveland International. Right. Yeah, you know, when he was at Epic. In fact, uh, that's that's when they talked. He he would occasionally uh, call me up and say, "Hey man, I want you to check this song out and see what you think of this new album." One was uh, the Boston. You know, he said, "I can't get anybody else in the room to like it," but I said, "You know, I'm listening to it's more than a feeling." Saying this is going to be an anthem, <laughs> but but nonetheless, he also turned me on the Southside Johnny, and he said, "Hey, check this guy out." And uh, when he's, you know, he announced that he was going to leave Epic and he's coming back to Cleveland to start on a label, Cleveland International. And it was uh, his ability to have an indie label, but distributed by a major distributor, you know, Columbia Records. And, uh, you know, he had all these different ideas, you know, Ronnie Spector and everybody else. But he said, one day I get this call and he says, you know, and this is after he moved back, he said, I gotta send you a tape. I want you to tell me what you think of it. And I uh, said it's it's different. I gotta see if you can like it. But y- you know, I understand. I, I like I like your you know. You always come up with the right ideas for things. So he sends me the Meatloaf album, and it's on cassette. It's before, d- and so I don't see the artwork. I don't see who Meatloaf is. I know don't know anything about it other than the music. And I'm listening to it, saying, my God. I've never heard anything like this in my life. My first, re- yeah, as a radio person, as you know, you're picking music to play on the radio, and this in 1977 was probably one of the greatest years uh, for rock and roll. I mean, you know, it. You had, you had, you had three albums come out in 19 in, in that year that really typified not only that year, but typified the, the, it, it represented the entire decade. One was Fleetwood Mac's Rumors, another was Hotel California, <laughs> and the third ended up being Bad Out of Hell. And it also w- was right there, with so I mean, it was, it was one of the biggest selling albums of, of that year as well. But anyway, here, it's, it's unknown. I'm listening to the cassette. I put it in my car, and it's like, you know, I'm trying to figure how is this gonna sound on the radio. Now, MMS became the rock station in Cl- Cleveland, but you want to keep it the number one station, so you can't make mistakes. You play, have to play the right music. And this is different than anything I've ever heard before. And it's almost like, l- you, it's almost like a Broadway play. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it was, and I'm listening to it saying, and it's just drawing me in. I'm saying, this is incredible. It sounds good when you're driving in the car. It t- sounds good when you're listening at home. You know, I, and I listened to it probably five or six times and then Popovich called me up the next day and, hey, man, what do you think? And I said, this thing is amazing. And I said, this could be a big record, but somehow you're going to have to convince these album rock stations to play 10-minute tracks. <laughs> because all these album rock stations are tame. They're all, they're, they're all fighting with each other competitively. We play the most music per hour. Well, you know, if there's a 10-minute cut, that means you're going to play one less track an hour, you know. And, and all these things, and, 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 you know, stations have commercials and all this other stuff. And he sort of said, well, how do I get around it? He says, well, I'll, t- I'll tell you what. You have any problems with radio stations, have them talk to me, and I'll, f- I'll tell them a way 
that they can play that song on the air. And we're concentrating on Paradise on the Bass Dashboard Light. I said, this is a coming of age song if there ever was one. And I said, you know, this, uh, this song is going to be the, it's going to be an anthem. And sure enough, what I did is when, you know, when the album came out and uh, we, we went on MMS and it became a, you know, we had the greatest listeners in the world. So they picked up very quickly on good music. But I actually ended up, because Steve couldn't do it, his record guys couldn't do it, but I'd call up the program directors that I knew and they all respected what I was doing because I had the number one album rock station in the country. And they said, you can play this record. You can just stop saying we play 18 songs an hour. Just say we play the best music an hour. And <laughs> sure enough, every station that started playing it uh, got response. And the sales followed. And I think there's only one station. It came out in Los Angeles. And uh, the program director is Sam Bellamy. I, no matter what, she didn't hear it. And I found myself, I'm, I, I was at a convention in Los Angeles, a music convention, and I'm sitting at a table with Sam Bellamy talking about Meatloaf, saying, why aren't you playing this thing? It came out to Los Angeles, you'd be playing it. This is, this is like traveling, this is like car music. <laughs> and I'm trying everything. The other person sitting at the table was Paul Winchell. Do you remember Paul Winchell? The, uh, you know, uh, Jeremy Mahoney the and the, uh, no. the ventriloquist and all that. Well, he, for some reason, I'm sitting at a table with him and Sam Bellamy, and, Je and, and, and uh, Paul Winchell is talking about, in, in addition to doing Paul, you know, Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith and the, and the, and the uh, marionettes and all that, he also invented the artificial heart. So we're having this brilliant conversation, and then it goes to Sam Bellamy again, I'm saying, you know, you ought to play this meatloaf, you're gonna love it. This is, and she says, I listen to it, I don't know how I'm gonna get it on my radio. Paul Winchell then says, meatloaf, I love that album. <laughs> So here's Paul Winchell, the guy that invent, you know, was, you know, a ventriloquist that we knew growing up, and he also invented the artificial heart, and he was a Meatloaf fan. I think Sam Bellamy finally put the song on the air. I think that <laughs> was the last station that, but I mean, really, the whole the whole thing is, it was unlike anything on that was being played on the radio. And this was a year that you had Eddie Money's first album came out, uh, Leonard Skinner's last album came out. Uh, Steely Down at Asia. Uh, God, I, I mean, there was just so many albums that came out in 1977. And for an unknown and an album as different as Meatloaf to become the one of the top three albums of the year is really a miracle. And it goes back to Steve Popovich. He heard something that no other label, I mean, he was the last person to, you know, every label said, passed on it. And Steve signed it. And also Steve had to motivate his own promotion people at, at Columbia Records to promote it because they didn't know how to promote it. You know, they're used to promoting, you know, Cheap Trick and they things like that. This this is a different animal all entirely. But nonetheless, and, and, and it was really Steve was just tenacious. I think I think that's that I think that uh, uh, Steve probably himself called every album radio station in the country maybe a dozen times until he got them to play it. And I I'd like to know when California did, when Be Sam Bellamy <laughs> added it, because I don't ever remember California ever, you know, falling into line. No, it was it, like forever. Yeah, it, it was, it was the definitely the last, came it was the last station in the world that ever so played. Because uh, we were smashed in the yeah. all over the world. No, and yeah, yeah, I know, it's getting played in Europe, it's getting played in Yugoslavia, but it's not getting played in Los Angeles. <laughs> I wanted to I, I wanted to go back with with Ellen and Carly to um, way back or, you know mid early seventies my heyday of course um, <laughs> set the scene for me because everybody's in New York Jim's in New York uh, Meatloaf in New York in the theater scene um, he does Rocky Horror Picture Show you guys are working a National Lampoon tour as you said and then. Jim writes Neverland, and is that how all this came together? You know, this is kind of a this is a little bit confusing to me because <laughs> Barry Keating uh, directed Neverland, and Ellen was the star of it. But the album was already so that was in like April or May of '77. Uh, so that album was already in the can. So it's not like the album was created after the play. But you know, Jim always had. These dreams. I mean, look. The coolest thing about Neverland that I remember is the the dance of the killer nuns. I don't know if you remember that. 
<laughs> so, oh, absolutely. There's these great big burly guys in, in nuns' in non outfits this with their Steinman. legs so bare, of course. Yeah. But cool. so I guess, you know, and I had come out of theater, and, uh, and obviously that was. Well, did you come to New York in theater, or did you oh, get I into came theater to New York. later? No, no, I had done theater in St. Louis in school. You know, I came, you know, right in the middle of college. So right. I had a, I came to New York, and I was always in my career. I had a band with my boyfriend, who Carla, I did, I had, anyway, that's a long story. It's a long story. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Not that no, story. this is crazy. She told me. And, and, but at the same time, I was auditioning. I was doing theater doing and theater stuff. Too, and that's okay. how I met Jim and me, too, yeah. because of theater. Right. Yeah. And I, I did theater. And then I was just finally the show that I had been in the, the New York and the Boston, New York, and Chicago company. It was it closed. And I had money and unemployment. And I thought, I'm, what do I want to do? People said, oh, you should just you know, get a cabaret act. And it's like, no, I wanted to do like the music of my generation. And uh, suddenly, I just started looking to be in a band that was uh, playing you know, original material. And I ended up in a band in Boston. So this is a long story, but it, it was called Orchestra Luna. And that's how I ended up in Meatloaf, because we, had, they, we were hired to be the band for Neverland. So we were never on stage. We were like off and playing and singing. And then we did a big show at Alice Tully Hall. It was very theatrical, it was a really eclectic band, punk, rock, jazz, fusion-y stuff, and, but very theatrical. I played like six different characters. And so they saw, they saw me in that, and I think at that point, I, I guess Ellen had already you know, pretty much decided not to do the tour. So uh, I got a call from Jim Steinman after they saw me in that. I didn't have to audition, they saw it, and that's how I ended up in Meat Loaf. So and Jim called me. <laughs> Ellen, did you have any idea? Give it up. <laughs> Ellen, did you have any idea when you're doing Neverland and when did it when did it come to fruition or did you hear about the idea that some of these songs were going to maybe morph into an album that Jim was gonna turn this into something done more? The album. Right? No, the no, the album hadn't been done yet. But it was seventy seven, Ellen. I know it was, it was, so it was spring of no, seventy seven. That we That's confusing, be, but I, th but I thought uh, that was right oh. after the National Lampoon show. Anyway, um, uh, well, but like I said, when we were, I was on the road with them, he was he was writing the songs, and uh, see, never let Jim has sort of recycled himself all <laughs> all his life. You know, Neverland started as as a show called The Dream Engine at Amherst College, where he went, and that it was a big sensation. They still, they, you know, Jim they went back there. Yeah. They still talk about it. You know, it, it was it was very dark. They were it all was, naked on stage. It was, was sexual, right. Of it. And uh, yes, applaud for that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, the, you know, it was the Dream Engine. Then it became Neverland. The, I sang Heaven Can Wait in Neverland. You played Wendy. I played Wendy because it's always been the Peter Pan, the Lost Boys. Um, that was Jim's fixation. Yes, yeah, the fixation, <laughs> and and then and then it, it you know the, and the song's been the record now the musical the Bat of Hell musical is basically the same show from 1969 or whenever it was back in in Amherst College right so but artists do that they they steal from themselves they recycle they change they but I mean it it reached its pinnacle obviously with with the album because. He had Todd Rundgren producing it, and it was an album, and it was it the the world was able to um, experience it. Does Does anybody know the dates that it was recorded? Because uh, that Todd was working on. I thought I read. It, it varies depending on what you read, uh, <laughs> because it, it came out in seventy seven, but they had worked on it right, in seventy five or whatnot, yeah. and then you know they tried to get the record deal. Right. Um, so yeah. it, I could see how it's yeah. confusing. I, I didn't want to. In terms of first impressions of, of Meatloaf, uh, Meatloaf obviously had Rocky Horror Picture Show and you saw his performance. It was an interesting thing you said, Ellen, uh, in a quote I read. You talked about being, you know, Broadway singers, but you said, no, we're rock and roll singers. And that was, that was the impression you got with Meatloaf. What, what was it like when you first saw him and heard him perform? Oh, whoa, 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 what's this? <laughs> Wait a minute. 
What have I signed up for? <laughs> um, yeah, because, you know, I mean, we come from theater, but, you know, I, I, I hate when people, yeah, like I did a show last week in New York, and somebody said, oh, it's rock and roll, but there's cabaret, there's Broadway. I'm like, no, please don't ever say, please not the C or the B word. Right, no cabaret. Okay? <laughs> no cabaret, <laughs> no Broadway. I mean, I did Broadway, I did straight Broadway shows. But um, I think it's the same for me. T I, I can do Broadway shows, but I'm not great at doing Broadway, but I do feel I am in my own, and I, what I do best is sing rock and roll. And Meat, meat was the same, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Joe, I wanna ask you, I know obviously you went on, you know, they approached you and brought you into the touring band. What, were you, what was your first impression? When did you first hear uh, Meatloaf and, and Bad Out of Hell? Meat played it to me. Um, when I came home from England from John Cale, uh, quickly tell that John Cale story because not everyone knows it. <laughs> just quickly, just a, two sentences. John I was going to skip it, Joe. I was going to oh, skip sorry. it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a good story. I was always a vegetarian, still am. <laughs> okay. we, we, we went to, with John Cale. John Cale was from the Velvet Underground. And and by the time we <laughs> by the by the time we went to to England, they were hailing him as the godfather of punk, and we were not punk. <laughs> so he got scared, and he wanted me to cut my hair off. It was very long, and 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 have a punk haircut, and I, and I wouldn't do it. So he came on stage with a chicken. We would s we were coming to London. We kept stopping at farms, and then he comes out of a farm w with a chicken, holding it by its feet, live chicken, throws it in the box, and I'm in the back of the van. What are you going to do with that chicken? You know, he said, "Shut up." So we get to the theater, and I have my roadie look for the chicken. I wanted it loose, couldn't find it. I thought. To have sex with it, I thought. You know, I, 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 I didn't know what he was going to do. We do the show. We do this Heartbreak Hotel. He leaves the stage during the guitar solo. Comes back on with a butcher's uniform, holding the chicken. He comes past the drums with his hand behind the back. He's got a meat cleaver, and he looks at the chicken and he says, "I could be so lonely. You could be so lonely. You could die." And he decapitates it. And he starts taking it by the feet, going like this, and the blood's coming up on the drums. And, and I, I walked off the stage. And I did a bunch of interviews. <laughs> Is that for me or the chicken? <laughs> I did some interviews, and Meat read my interview with Rolling Stone. And he wanted to see me. So I went in to see him. And he played me his record. And I, I said, I, I never heard anything like this. This is, this is incredible. And I really wanted the job. <laughs> um, so it was just Jim and Meat. And I think there was a bass player who I later fired. And I said, L let's play it. He says, you can't play it. And I said, you just played it for me. And I clicked it off, and we played Bad out of hell, start to finish, and I left that place with the job. Fabulous. Wow. Yay, Joey. <laughs> and then I started bringing, I brought in the guitar players. Um, cause we so the Kulik brothers were your find? You well, Bob was with me with John Cale, wow. and his brother Bruce, who was later in Kiss. I knew that they, between the two of them, they could kind of do what Todd did on the record. And then everyone brought in someone else, and it, it just, everybody brought in someone they knew who they felt could really do the right job. And that's how that band was put together. But the first time I heard it, he played it for me. And I just, I was stunned. I mean, I think everybody was stunned the first time they heard it. Ellen, it, I, I wanna ask first, how involved were you 
in the recording process, obviously, uh, Parad Paradise by the Dashboard Light, but then you sang backing on, on a few tracks as well. What was that recording process like for that album? Well, there was, there was a rehearsal period, which you usually wouldn't get, you know, making an album. Everybody, it was up in Bearsville, upstate near Woodstock. That's where Todd Rundgren had his studio. Everybody, you know, including Max Weinberg and Roy Bitten and Chasm Sultan, of course, he was Todd's bass player, Todd and Rory. Rory Dodd was up there singing and Meat and Steinman and, and myself. And there was a rehearsal period. There had to be, you know, because it's so, it's complicated. And um, so there was some time put into it. And, and uh, but, you know, I said to Carla today, I really do not have the ear for harmonies. So, so working, uh, I remember we were in, in the studio with Todd, and I think it was even Rory, and I don't know if he had done a lot of harmonies by then. He was uh, obviously a genius at it, yes. Italy. But, you know, and, you know, we're so nervous, and Todd said, if you can't get this, I will just sing it myself, he said. So, <laughs> so we're like, whoa, well, I, I, I guess we better learn this, you know, figure it out. So there was that. But then, you know, the big thing, of course, was, was doing the paradise. And uh, I always tell the story that, you know, because Meat sang his part um, separately. He sang, he sang by himself, and then I, I did my part alone. But I'm like, well, this is a duet. This is about this relationship. So I dragged Meat into the studio and sat him in a chair, and, you know, so I s could sing it at him. Uh, which is, and then I think I did it maybe once or twice, and that was it. It made it so much easier because I had my duet partner there. It wasn't just a dry studio uh, job. John, when, when Steve brought you the album, what was it about that song? Did he, w did he have that song specifically as something he wanted you to focus on? No, he wasn't sure. He, well, I think he was sure in his own mind, but he was hoping I'd pick up the same weight that I would, you know, that he would. And sure enough, it was like, you know, that is going to be an anthem. That is going to be, every kid can relate to that. Every age can relate to that. And, you know, we were the kind of station that we were, we, we, we really didn't want teens listening to us. We were an album rock station, so it's more adult music and all that. But we just wanted to, like, get the kids with, a, the, with the seniors in high school about to go to college. You know, that's, that's when you want to hit, that's when you want to, you know, the music taste change and all that. So what a better song than that to really capture, you know, a person's ear. I mean, it, it really, the, you know, the fact that I, I keep going back, there was, another, there, there was not another album that even came close to that. And you had a lot of great, you know, Queen's News of the World. You had all these albums coming out that year. Uh, it was a fantastic year. And then you had the, the Meatloaf album, which was different than anything that anybody's ever played on a rock and roll station before. But man, did it fit. I mean, it was just, you know, I, I, I just look at it, 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 it was a combination of uh, th these two guys, uh, you know, Jim and Meat, they, they, were, they were geniuses together. They, they crafted something that was just unimaginable. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't conceive of something like that. It just, I, I don't know how it came out of them. I, you know, I don't know what they, you know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of weird things and how uh, <laughs> albums that come together. I, the, the weirdest one I've ever heard in my life now is how you get the job. <laughs> the ch <laughs> I just keep thinking of that chicken over and over again. And, 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 no, and, and meeting John Cale, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> he would do something like that. But, you know, going back to what you said, it, it, it just fits so well. It, 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 it became, and it, it's, you know, it, it was an anthem to everybody's youth. You know, to uh, you know that that time of change as you're going to college and this and that, and, and e everybody can relate to that. Everybody had a paradise by the dashboard light moment sometime <laughs> in there. Correct. Uh, when it got to putting the tour together, um, Ellen, correct me if I'm wrong. You had a, a prior commitment, um, Broadway. You were on Broadway. Yeah, I was. I was doing hair on Broadway, and then I was in the movie of Hair. Um, but you know, uh, having been talking to Steve Popovich. He had said, well, you know, I think I can get you a record deal. So around that same time, right, right after that, that fall and into the next season, started doing um, 
demos and and he shopped it around and I mean that was another great thing in my life you know how how fortunate I mean so many people I knew were in bands and schlepping around the road for years hoping they could get a record deal blah blah you know I'm on this record and I have Steve Popovich and I get a record deal (laughs) you know and uh yeah, so I had a lot going on at the time. And, and so, Carla, you come into the mix, and you're tasked with bringing this song, this performance song, to well, you know, to we life. Were, we were. The, I gotta. I gotta give props to the entire live band because, truthfully, that record is as Steve was. I mean, there were all these pieces that had to fit together, and it. If you didn't have the genius of Jim Steinman's songwriting and the incredible focus of Meatloaf's performance, and then. Steve Popovich just wailing on, on getting it, getting the job done in the record industry, but he had to go after his own people over at, at uh, Epic Columbia, whatever, all those people. I mean, I remember him saying a story where he's like by the East River and he's waving bat out of hell at, I don't want to say his name, but <laughs> <laughs> someone who was very famous at the record company, and the guy grabbed it from him and threw it in the East River. <laughs> yes, so, and that guy to this day would probably say, Oh, I was the one that, you know, I'm the one that uh, championed Bad Out of Hell. How many people take credit for it? Okay. They all take credit. But I just want to I just want to mention since we did sort of mention the band's name, uh, Bruce Kulick, uh, who sends his love. He would have loved to be in here, but he's working. He's a working guy. He's still playing with Kiss and Grand Funk and whoever else he's a fabulous guy. And his brother who passed away also in the last couple of years. I don't know when when did Bob when did he pass, do you know? Um, it's like two years just, ago. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, but it was just like this perfect combination of things, and then obviously Joe and Paul Glenn's uh, on, on on electronic keyboards and Steinman. I mean, we were out there with Steinman and Steve Buslow on bass, and so <laughs> so this whole group were just kind of at this meat loft. I was sending, I've been sending Steve pictures and also Joey because I'm just finding some from that rehearsal period, and you know. We were just trying to play these phenomenal songs. As I said, Jim Steinman, when I said, when I said Jim, so exactly, because Jim really was my entree there, you know, and, and I said, so exactly what's going to go on during Paradise there? And he goes, Carla, you'll figure it out when you get on stage. <laughs> and that was my direction. I, I, I had that, and then their manager, David Sonnenberg, said, play against character. So that's like an actor's thing for like, okay, you're a happy, sweet person. Just don't be that person on stage. So anyway, and it was acting. It was like against your own character. Yeah, my own character. So it was, you know, it was an acting gig, really, that I could sing the hell out of. So it was really, really fun for me. You know, it was crazy. And there were so so many ridiculously crazy experiences. But just getting out on the road and starting, you know, as we talked about opening for Cheap Trick and, and... Getting booed. I, were we booed off the stage? Did we do we, a limited we did set? Not, we, we didn't we finish didn't get our past set. fifteen minutes. Yeah, and tomatoes. Yeah, no, because they were like in shock. They had never heard the record. They weren't playing it in Chicago then. <laughs> well, I wish the, they would have. The record yeah. wasn't out yet. Yeah. Oh, that's right. So it was we're, before we're it was really. We're trying to play this to people who never heard it anyway. Yeah, it was kind of silly. They wanted to see Cheap Trick. Yeah, they didn't it was. It was. Us. They were the Rockford fans. But so also, anyway. you know, Jim and, and me, they're coming from theater so they were bringing that mentality because I think I read an interview oh, where you absolutely. said they started with a speech right like that was the opening yes. of the set and of course the cheap trick crowd was like what the hell is this? It, <laughs> right but it was it was the theatrical experience it really was like a mini rock opera it, from beginning to end the people that we all were on stage like carried all the way through you know and you had the driving force the point of the arrow you had meatloaf out there just giving every ounce of whatever that man had you know to get the audience, so. Joe, what was it like, w- somebody being with on stage with someone like Meatloaf? Because we've all seen the videos and the photos. Intense, it's intense, and he's giving it everything he's got. W- what's that like? <laughs> there's no chicken involved. There's no, there's <laughs> no, no, there's meatloaf. no chicken, there's <laughs> meatloaf now, <laughs> you know. Um, Did he ever uh, bite you? <laughs> no. Because he used to bite <laughs> Steve Buslow. No, no, he never, no, no, Meek and I never had a, 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 a mean word, we never fought, he, he, he was, he was beautiful with me. What was it like? 
I, I always felt that no matter what song he was singing, he, 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 was, he was that character. Yes, but I always felt if you just, if you tapped him on the shoulder while he was singing any of those songs and said, what's your phone number? He wouldn't be able to tell you. He, he, he'd probably look at you like, and not even know who you were. I would be playing, and I would be able to say, yeah, 516, eight. He, he was in the moment, and I learned that from him. He was in the moment, and he, he wasn't there. He got out of his own way, and, and it just came out of him. I never saw anything like it. I, well, actually, I did. John Cale was like that, too. But those are the only two people that if you interrupted them, you probably get hit or a look like, you know, who are you? Is it, what was it like for you, Carla? Because you, you're playing this this character, you know, you, you're acting. Um, but I read the story. It's like you, you guys had the kiss, um, and that would be intense. And then I think I read he might have, you know, he was hurling a, a mic stand at you oh, as part of the, that the was performance. Just a, yeah, no, this was something that I sort of did speak to the stage manager and the rest of the band about later <laughs> because I had no idea at some point in Paradise he would go and, and in fact, I just saw a picture of it where he sneaks over and he picks up this mic stand and then he's like waving it around like a, a crazed, uh, you know, whatever, Ralph Cramden or whatever the guy from <laughs> The Honeymooners because he... You know what he says at the end of it. To the moon. Then, yeah, to the moon. But uh, so, and he throws it at me. He throws it at me. But I always, at that moment, just for whatever choreographic reason, I was always bent over like this. And one night, I just rose up right in time to feel that swish right by my head. And I thought, maybe someone should have told me that that was happening because <laughs> he could take my head off. It, it was just, but no, but he was in the moment. And it was just part of the whole thing. I, it, you know, we were, and it was like an improv. I studied at Second City in Chicago before I ended up in New York, and it really, he really did come from that essence, too, you know, where it just came in the moment, and... There's know. always a sense of danger there. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's bad out of hell, you know. It's a guy on a motorcycle who, you know, goes over the cliff, and that's it, and he was always on the edge, it was always on the edge, right? It, it's him, he wasn't a skinny, you know, he wasn't one of those skinny English rock stars in the leather pants with the flowing hair. He was just every man standing up there with all of his might and just, you know, no wonder people went crazy. I mean, it was phenomenal. He really broke like a wall when he did that. But what yeah, you were well, No, just speak to what Joe was saying. He really, dad would tell you that he was an actor first. Well, absolutely, yeah. He was an actor first and, um, you know, I grew up with him on the road, and I'm watching him on stage, and then joining his band later. But it it was a there was a marked difference from Showtime. You know, you're he's dad, but then suddenly it's Showtime. Right. You know, so you you let him be, <laughs> and you leave him alone, and you let him do his process, and get into it, get into that character, and he would bring it all up, you know? And you just step out of the way. Absolutely. Yeah. And on th in, in the green room, I mean, you know, you really did have to do that at the beginning when we were really trying to get it going. And he would just start kicking the folding chairs, and it really Folding chairs, he had a he problem with folding I chairs, apparently. <laughs> yeah. But better he than liked a to chicken. Throw folding chairs. <laughs> yeah. I was so. gonna ask you, Pearl, if, if when you you know got on tour with him for Bad Out Hell Two, especially, did it mellow out? I mean, obviously he was getting older, and and that tour obviously Bad Out Hell took him. Did what mellow out? Meatloaf <laughs> <laughs> mellow no, out at all? He never <laughs> mellowed out. What are you talking about? Well, I read the stories, and, and a lot of stuff they talk about. I mean, that tour. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe. And, and Carla, did it take a lot out of them? I mean, that's you guys toured for a long time. Can, and you, the speak oxygen? Yeah. can you speak to the oxygen, oxygen after this? every night. The oxygen and it to was the point no where joke. Like he, he would collapse after every show. And then did you guys as well also like so, you know learn to like step over him? Yeah. That's, we, that's exactly we just, right. We would step over him and go, good show, meet, and uh, go to the dressing room. This still was going he's, on. He's rolling on the ground. <gasps> But no, he, had his, he had this his was still his going on when you were roadie. touring. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And, and then you know, it's kind of like, good show, me. Yeah. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. Yeah. you know. No, no, it was terrible. It was oh, terrible. Oh, 
Yeah, yeah right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have to understand what it was like with, with, with people heard, you know, our listeners heard the album first. And then when they saw the show, <laughs> they were mesmerized. I mean, I have never seen, you know, I, I've seen many concerts, many incredible concerts. But when Meatloaf took the stage and with all the theatrics involved, People didn't move. Their eyes, it, it was like deers in the headlight. People were just staring. They couldn't believe it. And it was amazing to see that album that people were getting to know and seeing it performed live, you know, as a musical. Yeah. It really blew people's minds. I'm curious, uh, Joe and Carla, when you guys started the tour, no budget, you know. I, I mean, the record label is kind of like, yeah, whatever. Uh, and then take me back to in this point where I think it's the CBS convention. Uh, convention in New Orleans. That's where everything changed, right? It exploded, <laughs> right, Joey? I mean, it was insane. And finally, you had all these guys in a room. We've got photos. I don't even I think know. If it's they were I think thing. it was January '78. I want to say right. It was. That it, was. it was just yeah. so. It was January. We started out. When was our first gig? You were saying, Joe? Was it October? But it was before. Oh. Sometime. I don't. Well, know. whatever. So here it, it is was January. O- it was October or November. Okay. Yeah. So so it's January, and finally, everybody's wrangled into a room and sees what Meat delivers and what we all deliver and what that show is, and they go nuts. They're like, these record industry guys that are so jaded are like standing on tables. They had trays that their food were on. They were beating them. They throw their jackets in the air. They like ran, and they did storm the stage. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, but... It, it was the artists like Billy Joel oh, yeah. who really yeah. started it. They, yeah. they couldn't believe what they were yeah, seeing. And, right. and Billy got on top of the table and just started stamping. Really? Yeah. I forgot and then about everyone that. Else, <laughs> yeah, then, then wow. the company, as usual, <laughs> they just went nuts. And they, they, when we were done, they came up with our new million dollar act. And there was no money. Yeah. <laughs> there was, there was we really had no money. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody thinks I must be so wealthy because I was on the first <laughs> tour. There was no money. It was like two. We were paid two hundred and sixty-five dollars a week, something insane like it, that. It was really and we fought for it like a twenty-five dollar raise. Yeah, it was I really have the band small. notes. I was the secretary. <laughs> we, we just we just believed in it and and we wanted to do it. And it wasn't that they were being cheap. There was no money. There was no there money was yet. Yeah. And when that DVD came out, the original tour. Yeah. I'd never seen them. I'm in the back. I only see everyone's ass. Oh, that's I've right. never seen anybody I played with <laughs> from the front. So, I, and me always split his pants. So it was like, <laughs> come on, man. Hey, wait. But he he no. got stretchy material eventually because he was doing like somersaults. How could you not split your Did pants? Did that continue too, bro? The, 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 the pants splitting when you got on the road with them? No. no, they had better no. pants then. Better he pants then. Yeah, he discovered spandex by then. No, but when need, that, you, that you DVD that finally moving. came out, I was able to see the band. Yeah. And there was no theatrics. I mean, what I'm. There was no, like today you get like an Aerosmith. DVD and it's like yep. everything that's going on. It was just us yeah. and three tiers of lights. That's all that's it, it was. There was nothing else happening but us, and and we're killing ourselves. My one of my last conversations with me, we were talking about our bodies and like what, how we're dealing with it now and how we're hurting. And I said, me. I'm up there pounding like crazy. You're doing somersaults. <laughs> we were fucking killing ourselves. <laughs> no wonder why we hurt now. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ellen, you, you know, in, in starting your career, it's Steve getting you the record deal and stuff. Did you, how did, how did that affect you? Because as the tour starts to take off and the album's getting, because it you know, got bigger and bigger and bigger, um, did you feel that as well being... Uh, the singer on this this massive single that was just getting more popular as time went on. D- did you feel your career sort of picking up as well? Well, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was weird. Okay, it was strange. We had a weird thing. That's the weird thing of you know uh, the video was me singing and Carla on 
on the video, you know, <laughs> which, you know, you, you know, I always say, you know, for years it was like, oh, that color, the, why are you That was before she I knew me. <laughs> she but did not know me then. I did we not never know each her, other. but we've become very close, and yeah. we sang an, a duet on an album I made. Fabulous uh, album which she made last year. will be it's sold wonderful. out in front. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, so, I mean, but I, I you know, had my first album, I uh, was produced by Mick Ronson and Ian Hunter, and I had a song that was like number one. You know, I toured a lot in in Europe, and um, you know, it's I, I kind of didn't look back. But I mean, through the years, it's like as the years go on, the more almost recognition. I I was telling these guys I was well, I live in uh, Manhattan, and the other day I'm walking down the street, and some woman's going, "Hey, Ellen, stop right there!" You know, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I gotta yes, tell you. Yes. I think that is because of how great your record that you just came out. You're, you you just been this gal is busting her behind on stage oh, with a band. Carla. No, it's really it's really amazing. And I don't want to say your age, but you're only like maybe eight months older than me or six months older. Well, you know, we're all so, some, we're somewhere there. Yeah. I mean the joke I've so been making here about this event we're doing tonight. Absolutely. I'm like, okay, so they they're celebrating the 45th because the 50th, you know, they're not sure so we'll be alive, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm like, okay, I get it. We're all I here get now. it. But um, no, like I say, it it it's just, it's been an incredible like boon to my life. It's something I always say. I am afforded to be a horny teenager. Forever into eternity because of paradise, you know. And, and I will say it's fabulous, and um, her vocal on it is amazing. But I will say that those videos really did bust the record. Yeah. In so many places, like the, in the Netherlands, it, we got there, and like one out of every two households had it. I mean, it's like, right. where has that been? And we, you know, we show up in Australia, and it, it was like we were the Beatles. I mean, it was yeah. insane, you know. So. It, that those, no, absolutely. Yeah, the theatricality of that really did help. But, it, but we then, were bonded. You, back yeah. then, you needed a video, you know, because you everybody you weren't touring Europe that much, so so the videos were really important. Like even pre MTV, yeah. like Don Don Kirshner's uh, rock concert. rock, <laughs> rock show, you know, concert. The videos were important in this video, but also these guys broke this record by touring. Yes. You know how many how many bands uh, accrue gigantic success through touring and touring and touring. Yeah. And that's, that's you guys really broke the record playing live. I, uh, so much of it. I have you know, a ton of questions, but I know the audience does too. So we have uh, some mic handlers out there roaming around. These lights are really bright. Um, if you have a question for anybody on the panel, we want to open that up right now. Raise your hand and someone will come over to you. Here's someone right there. Yes. Get a bunch of Front and center. Good evening. What? Hello. There we go. Good evening to all of you, first of all. Bad Out of Hell is the greatest album ever made. But, yes. But my favorite album is Braver Than We Are. Oh, that is so sweet. Ellen and Carla, what was it like working with Meet and Jim again after so many years on Braver Than We Are for going all the way as uh, just the start? We were really, really kind of tickled to be able to do that. I, you know, the song is a fantastic song. And the idea that Meat wanted to do that with us and that, you know, Jim's trying to get as many of his songs to Meat because they were really trying to bond again for that. And it was really amazing. You know, we didn't, we didn't sing at the same time, but we were in Nashville right. at the same time at the hotel. And we actually, I think I still have this footage, we actually made a little video of us for Steinman in our pajamas. That's right. our, we said, yes. it's our, we it's had our a pajama, pajama party, party. It was sweet. Because he's, you know, he wasn't available to talk no. at that time. No, but yeah. all those many years later, you know, it's, you know, Meat was bright. very chill and we were very, you know, very respectful and very sweet and every, all Couldn't the, nice whatever thing. negative, negative, me, negative things that had happened in centuries past <laughs> were, we're all, and it was, it, was a, it was great. It was a lovely yeah, thing really, to do. It's really yeah. terrific. 
for the I just want to say thanks for mentioning that record. That I love my Uncle Steve. He yes. was he was he was my be I I miss him dearly. But I want to say one thing. In 1978, I was 18 years old and I was front row with the Meatloaf concert. <laughs> And let me tell you, the party afterwards, I never went to school the next day. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am blessed to be the first concert front row. Thank you, guys. I love you all. Was that the Blossom? So no question. <laughs> was that the... John, the Blossom... Was it, I, I don't know. Was that the Blossom Music Center show? Yeah. Cleveland. Oh, yeah. That, 1978 John, that Blossom. That was the, the best show, ever. The photo was up here where he was... Yeah. You guys presented, or he was presented with the plaque, the platinum plaque. That's right. Yes, yeah, we did the the, the, uh, the presentation of the uh, gold. I think it was the platinum, platinum album. Platinum, right? And uh, that was also when uh, Leo did the uh, Kid Leo did the uh, narration during pa pa Paradise by the Light. Oh, yeah. 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 So I think we actually have a question. <laughs> um, I so test, test, test. Okay. Hello. So this question is actually question. for Pearl. Um, there was a not totally well-received movie about your dad. Uh, I was just wondering what his opinion uh, was of the movie and what like your opinion was of the movie. Are you talking about the VH1 movie? I've never seen it. <laughs> um, it was. It. it I think it took a lot of artistic license. Did you? Did you? Anyone uh, see it? I didn't see it. Um, I saw it. It was a. It? It was fiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's yeah. VH1? What is what is VH1? I don't know. I'm not sure I'm anymore. Not that young. I'm not that young. <laughs> um, and it was an and it was unauthorized too. I mean, it was it was not it did not reflect what really happened. Well, it what it dad dad went on set and we've since m I've made really great friends with W. Earl Brown who played dad in that movie. He's a, he's actually a fantastic actor and you've probably all seen him in something. He's that guy. You know what I mean? He's he's the hardest working character actor in show business, and um, and it's and uh, Zach Throne who played Jim in the in the film. He, he, play guitar he plays guitar, guitar with me. Oh, he uh, plays with me. Yeah, he's and a darling man. he's a wonderful. The, they're wonderful actors and wonderful people, and they were just doing their job. But um, the movie was. Um, interesting <laughs> it, I an that you did <laughs> really? Steve Pavard Jr. made an appearance in the all what right were, what, what, what was scene. your appearance I didn't see you what who, what were, what did you do oh my God. you did oh my god did you have lines All right, here's a question. How long did you tour basically the core band? You know, how long did that go on? Because I saw you at Nautica here. I don't remember when that was, but Meatloaf was there, but I don't remember who was there, who it, wasn't, and it, I was just kind of wondering. It about was that. the entire run of the Bad Out of Hell album. If you saw Meat ever play again live, it would have been in support of Dead Ringer, which was the, that album. Uh, so we, we started in 77. I think we played almost through 79, something like that. Yeah, 79. Yeah, it was like two we years. Did something, two years. Yeah. So, so I don't remember Nautica as a... Yeah, I think the Bad Out of Hell tour came here. It might have been four times, I think. Agora, maybe Music Hall a couple times. Yeah, we played and a bunch Blossom. of times. Yeah, yeah, and then Blossom was the culmination. Or More questions? Did you get to ask your question? Oh. Yes. This lady has a microphone back there. Oh, sorry. So, oh, yes. Give her right. so um, two things. I will totally so take what, your what was Meatloaf's real name? And secondly, I hope that Ellen and Carla, you could just sing a little something a little bit for us tonight. <laughs> you take the name question. <laughs> Dad, Dad was born Marvin Lee a day. And um, later in the, in the 90s, he changed it to Michael Lee a day. He, he never liked Marvin. And um, the story that he always told us was because he was a big kid. He was always a big kid. He's a, always a big kid. 
Um, and there was a Levi's commercial that was on the radio when he was little that literally said, poor fat Marvin can't wear Levi's. Oh. <laughs> and he, he said that, that <laughs> he never liked his name. And Meatloaf was a nickname that was given to him, not, not in, the, in, the, in the nicest of ways. Um, and we were talking about this earlier today. I loved what you said about today. this earlier today. Yeah, he was bullied a lot because of his size when he was a kid. And he was called Meatloaf by his dad and by kids at school and by his football coach. And so um, he, he told us, me and my sister, he said, so what I did was I said, fuck you. <laughs> I'm not getting rid of this name. I'm going to take this name and I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to reprogram it and I'm going to become a fucking superhero. Yay! <laughs> Woo! I have so that's what he did. He didn't run away from it. He didn't hide from it. He embraced it and he ripped it apart and rebuilt it into something completely new and invincible, which is incredible. We have a question front row right here first. Thank yes, thank you. Sorry, I stole a microphone. Um, I figured I'd take advantage. Uh, this question is for Pearl. So I'm here with my parents tonight. We talk about Paradise being a coming of age song. Um, I grew up on Meatloaf, karaoke nights in the living room with Meatloaf. And my Meatloaf coming of age song was really from Couldn't Have Said It Better, which I know has nothing to do with Jim Steinman but it's one of my most favorite albums, along with my parents, and it's impossible to find in the sense of it's not digitally available anywhere, but we it's personal to us. I was wondering what your feelings on it were and what your dad's feelings were on the album. Um, I think he loved all of his albums in, yeah. in different ways, in separate ways and together ways, but um, I don't really... I can't really speak very much on Couldn't Have Said It Better. I was in the video for that song, Couldn't Have Said It Better. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And it was a very cool video with Nigel Dick directing. And um, Patty was in the video. Um, but that's really all I really could tell you about it. I don't know why it's hard to find. It is hard to find. Yeah. We, we just did a, a memorial for Dad and a private one in Los Angeles. And I was putting together the playlist like you had playing tonight. And there were some songs you can't find them. They're just not available, and I don't know why. I, I don't know why. It must be tell some you. licensing problem so, yeah, or company. Something. Something. I think Columbia Records always loses things. Like they, they <laughs> you know, they, 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 they lose royalty checks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All the way in the back. Quick question. Uh, I'm a big Meatloaf fan, a big Todd Rundgren fan. And I've heard that Todd Rundgren is kind of a pain in the butt as a producer. <laughs> Just curious if there's any truth to that. Well, if you want to get things perfect and you're doing incredibly layered music and vocals and it's all on you, I, I guess you'd call him a pain in the ass. But he and Steinman were a great team because Steinman was a perfectionist too. So I don't think, certainly, certainly no one objected to the fact, I mean, like I said before, doing the vocals, we were a little terrified of him for very good reasons because he was Todd Rundgren. But he, uh, no, just so just to be around that kind of genius, both he and having him and Jim in one room, and they had an incredible repartee. They were both very funny, and their back and forth, and and being around them was really a lot of fun and very. Enriching and Jim adored him. Oh, no, yeah, no matter my God. what, snarky, whatever, anything Todd had to say, Jim loved it. Oh my God! He didn't God, care. Yeah. It, we worked with. Uh, I worked with him for what we thought was going to be Bad Out of Hell Two or Renegade Angel or whatever the second Meatloaf album was going to be. We all were up in um, Bearsville, and it was really interesting because I told this little story, Todd, uh, Todd had his giant, you know, he was at the forefront of video work. Oh, yeah. And so he had this giant video studio there at Bearsville, and really that's where his heart was, that's where his head was. And so there, we'd be sitting around, uh, Steinman and Pearl's uncle, Tom, Tom yeah. and, who was the engineer uh, for those sessions, or, and, and, and somebody go, okay, you go get Todd. No, Jim go, no, you get Todd. 
no, no, you go get Todd. And finally, I just marched down to, to the video thing and said, Todd, you're wanted. You know, and he's, uh, he, he's, you know, it's that thing when you have somebody who's a genius, they're, you take all the stuff that comes with them. So. Yeah. Yeah. We have one more question somewhere. Okay, back here, I see. Thank you all very much for coming. This is just fantastic. Um, can everybody tell me what their favorite song is on the album? It's hard to pick. <laughs> Bad out of hell. I got to say, that was my favorite one to do live every single night. I mean, he would close with it every night, and it, it never gets old. <laughs> it was always, it's my most favorite to, to perform live. My, uh, I have to say my other favorite on that album, on Bad Out of Hell, is For Crying Out Loud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah same here, crying, For Crying Out Loud, and Heaven Can Wait. Yeah. yeah. Heaven Can Wait, but... You know, there's just something about uh, all revved up when we would play it. I don't know. It's just like, boom. It was just yeah. like. And when it kicks into gear nothing, in the know, second baby, part. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, really. Yeah. 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 That one kind of drove me crazy, too. So. It's, it's, a whole, it's a whole night of fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's what we're going to do. We have a, another video we're going to show uh, for you guys. Uh, we're going to get everybody off stage. Um, and give them a minute, give them a couple minutes after the video ends because uh, they'll take their place if they want out in the lobby. If you want to, you know, buy a book or get something to sign or just say, hey, we love you. I'll be back over here if somebody wants to take a selfie with me or something. <laughs> but but, um, but I will say we love you. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We love you. I wanna, before we get off stage, I want to thank you guys so much. It's such an honor for me to be a part of these things. Thank you, to be on stage with you guys. Well, thank you, everybody. This is the... Biggest crowd we've had for one of these. So, thank you. Steve, thank you, man.